Today on Cross Defense, we talk with Reverend Christopher Toma of Our Savior Lutheran Church and School in Heartland, Michigan, about the hate crime bill in that state that could make speaking the truth in love a felony. Essentially what it'll do is it'll make doctrinal confessions uh, felony hate crimes. Along the way, Pastor Toma offers us wisdom for preparing for hard times. And, and he offers us wisdom on how pastors can faithfully work to prevent persecution before it arrives. Evangelicals are learning what Lutherans may have forgotten. Remembering our heritage will change everything, my friends. It's all coming up right now on Cross Defense. Welcome to Cross Defense. This is the show that aims to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, and aims to do all of that with God's Word. I'm your host, Reverend Tyrell Bramwell. I'm the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California, where we're not afraid to fight the good fight of faith, as St. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. If during the show you'd like to send us your comments, your questions, your Bits of biblical brilliance? Well, then go to stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S, ferndale.com slash contact. You can also find St. Mark on Instagram and Facebook if you'd like to communicate that way. And I'm on YouTube where I host all of our winged lion videos in service to the church's evangelism efforts. You can find me there. Just look for my name. If you have a general comment, my friends, and you want to review or rate this show on the podcast platform that you use to listen to Cross Defense, we'd love that. We'd appreciate it very much. We're grateful for any and all help that you can give us in sharing this program with our neighbors. We want to equip all Christians out there. We want to spread the gospel in the process, comforting souls so they too can defend the cross. They can do their apologetic and evangelistic work in their faithful witness vocationally right where God has planted them and have this little bit of a resource to help them along the way. Now, on to today's show, dear saints. It's been years since we've had a guest on this show. It was back when I was still at the seminary when we had our last guest. Now, as longtime listeners know, We used to have them on on a regular basis. Well, the drought ends today, my friends. The drought, the guest drought, it's over. Thanks for letting us know who you'd like to hear from on this show. Our producer has a list, a working and growing list, and we're working on securing a lineup for not only pastors. Of course, we're going to have LCMS pastors on the show, but we're also trying to find experts in different fields to help us equip our minds and excite our imaginations in regard to curious cultural topics. And there's no end to them in the world, is there? No, sir, there's not. We have so much going on around us. We need to equip our minds, excite our imaginations and how we think about these things so that at the end of the day, we are always comforted by Christ crucified for the forgiveness of our sins. Our souls rest securely in the cross. So to that end, I have the privilege the great honor of sharing my conversation with Reverend Christopher Toma with you today. Reverend Toma serves as senior pastor of Our Savior Lutheran Church and School in Heartland, Michigan. He is regularly involved in issues pertaining to church and state, engaging executive, legislative, and judicial leaders at the local, state, and federal levels, my friends. He's involved in various action committees. He speaks at political conferences, Right to Life and Lutherans for Life assemblies, theological symposia. The guy's everywhere. He directs the annual, the Body of Christ and the Public Square Conference, and he partners with Tier 1 thinkers, where he shares the stage with prominent newsmakers such as Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, Dinesh D'Souza, Candace Owens, Charlie Kirk, and I could go on forever, so many others. Stick around to the end of the show to learn how you can get discounted, discounted tickets to this year's The Body of Christ and the Public Square Conference in Michigan to listen to the likes of Dr. James Lindsay, Molly Ziegler-Hemingway, Seth Dillon of the Babylon Bee, 
and Riley Gaines. Oh, and the sound of Freedom's own Tim Ballard. The show, the, the actual human person that the show is based on, the agent that Jim Caviezel plays in that show, as well as the man himself, Reverend Christopher Toma. All right, so as if that wasn't enough work to keep this pastor busy all day long, he's also the author of a nearly unending catalog of books, my friends, including a highly entertaining and extremely informative series that I love, my favorite of all of his works. Well, that's a hard that's a hard thing to nail down, but I think my favorite, the series The Angel's Portion, a clergyman's whiskey narrative. If you've ever thought about getting into whiskey drinking and you don't know the first thing about it like I didn't, this is the series for you. All right, so we're proud to sell Reverend Toma's books at butterfatbooks.com and to that end we've collected a little online store for you and you'll find the link to that in the, in the description below as well where you can get a, a feel for some of his books and I say some of them because I'm sure by the time we publish that page and by the time you watch this episode he's already probably published I don't know two or three more books he's he's that prolific the guy is just unending I could say a lot more but you probably just want me to get to the interview yeah all right so you have before you a conversation I had with Reverend Christopher Toma to find out what's going on with Michigan in Michigan with the Michigan House Bill 4474, which, as I read from the document itself, says a person is guilty of a hate crime if that person maliciously and intentionally intimidates another individual based in whole or in part on an actual or perceived characteristic of that individual's race or color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or expression, physical or mental disability, age, ethnicity, national origin, or association with certain groups. The person who is found guilty of intimidation is guilty of a felony punishable by imprisonment for not more than two years or by a fine of not more than $5,000 or both. And that's for the first violation. It goes up after that. And now get this, dear saints, get this. There are two definitions given at the end of the bill. First, the definition of gender identity or expression. It, they define it as meaning to have or, or being perceived as having a gender-related self-identity or expression whether or not associated with an individual's assigned sex at birth. And the second definition is intimidate. Intimidate means a willful course of conduct involving repeated or continuing harassment of another individual that would cause a reasonable person to feel terrorized, frightened, or threatened, and that actually causes the victim to feel terrorized, frightened, or threatened. Intimidate does not include constitutionally protected activity or conduct that serves a legitimate purpose. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with on today's show. And I don't know about you, but I'm not exactly confident that our civil servants today, this current crop of them, have demonstrated, as of late anyway, that they know what constitutes a reasonable individual. Do you have that certainty? I don't. But without any further ado, let's talk with Reverend Christopher Toma about what Michigan's hate crime bill will mean for Christ Church in the Wolverine State. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, the bill is, or excuse me, the act itself, uh, the Ethnic Intimidation Act, um, it's designed to protect uh, relig against uh, religious, uh, ethnic, and racial discrimination. Okay. Um, but of course, they've included now sexual orientation, gender identity, uh, and expression in this bill. Um, uh, which, um, you know, we shouldn't have, uh, here in Michigan, we shouldn't have expected it to go any other way. Any, any, any bills like, any acts that are on the books like this um, after the uh, change of the Elliott Larson Act back in March um, of this year, which actually goes into effect 
uh, March of 2024. That's a very dangerous situation right What's now. That but uh, um, well, that's the Civil Rights Act, the 1976 Civil Rights Act for Michigan, and they did the okay. exact same thing there. They made gender identity, um, sexual orientation, protected classes. Okay. Um, so if you discriminate now, if you don't, you know, you have to hire and fire based on this act. You have to. You have to allow uh, uh, leniency for staff already uh, working for you. You have to do these kinds of things now here in Michigan. Uh, so that's going to be um, that's going to cause a lot of problems for Christian businesses, for Christian schools, churches, maybe not so much the way I read okay. it, okay. Um, uh, because um, it, it has to there has to be a consistency in your record. So, for example, a mature, a Lutheran church, you know, if we hire and fire based on Lutheran doctrine, that's fine. Um, that, that we, we are in place to serve as Lutherans. Okay. In schools, it gets a little bit shadier. It gets a little bit, there's more gray area. Um, you have a school there. We do. We have a preschool through eighth grade tuition free school. And, and, but the thing is, is all of our students, our clientele are not all Lutherans and most Christian schools are not. Right. So if that's the case, you now cross into that area where the state can come after you um, because you're you're now considered public accommodation. So uh, it's it's going to get messy. But we but again, we shouldn't have expected anything less than this um, with things like the Ethnic Intimidation Act, with the other uh, things that are likely coming down the pike, too. Um, this is it's it's a dark day. Christians are very close to having to be in the shadows here in this state yeah so let's talk a little bit about that what is how how are you as and and all the other other churches there but especially just you because you can speak to yourself and your congregation and your school how how's the conversation there at in heartland about these things is there is there consensus among the saints that you tend to want to um are, to be prepared for this, are you guys ready for this? Are you have you been preparing for this? I, I think the I know the answer to this, but um, what's your feeling on all that? Well, I think, um, relatively speaking, compared to a lot of other congregations, I think we probably are prepared. Okay. Um, nevertheless, well, and let me back up. Um, I, of course, with my dealings in the public square, I do a lot of work in these areas, and I, I work with a lot of different uh, folks in the legislature. Uh, I work with the, the judicial branch too. I mean, just, you know, dealing with these folks and every time I'm, I'm do any time I do these things, I bring all of the information back to my own congregation. That's, that's point one for me uh, to make sure that I'm communicating these things. Uh, and I also have various, um, messages that go out at various networks too. And, but my own congregation is, is my chief priority. And I send out a weekly message to my congregation and, and uh, when I do that, I talk about these kinds of things. So my congregation is very, I, I think, is very aware. I can't imagine if I were going to put a percentage on the folks here at Our Savior, I would have to say that maybe 99.5% of all of them are are glad that we're moving in the ways that we're moving, that we're engaging in the ways that we're engaging. Um, the folks who aren't typically transferred to a place where the pastor is the opposite of that, doesn't want anything to do with any kind of stuff. And that's fine. You know, we can be yeah. Christian friends from a distance. In fact, with some folks, I actually prefer that. So, you know, I'll just, just, just be clear about it. Yeah. Um, but now um, other congregations, I'm, I don't think they are as aware um, and, the reason for that being, again, because for the most part, a lot of pastors are are doing what they think is right in the sense of trying to stay in their lane, leave the government things to the government and the church things to the church. And yeah. and I think they're going to they're gonna be caught off guard. Um, they're going yeah. to be caught off guard in these things. So they have been coming for a long time. I mean, back in, uh, what was it, 2017, the uh, um, same-sex marriage uh the Supreme Court, you know, this will never happen. This will never happen. Uh, and it happened, <laughs> you know, yeah, it absolutely yeah. happened 2018 right away here in Michigan, Elliot Larson, our, again, our civil rights act was already on the table. The, uh, we have a commission, a civil rights commission of five unelected folks who were already interpreting that act with sexual orientation, uh, gender expression, as the defining term for the for the word sex, according to that act, 
Uh, we had a lawsuit uh, that was put into place almost immediately by our attorney general, uh, Schutte, and uh, it was shot down by the courts. Uh, we have very liberal courts. So um, we were already uh, for years moving in this direction. Um, we, we shouldn't be surprised. So do you think then, yeah. I mean, get, given everything you just said, is this bill going to pass the Senate and get the governor's sign off? Yeah, it's going yeah. to. Um, right. It'll pass the Senate. And uh, it won't be because uh, necessarily because of a, a liberal majority, but it'll be because of uh, some very weak need Republicans that we have. Um, uh, we have yeah. some very weak, they, they claim conservatism, but... Uh, you know, when, when these bills are getting going through the legislature, I'm always watching on YouTube. I'm, I'm if I can if I can schedule it so that I can watch it. I, I try, and as I'm watching, I'm watching the votes and I, and I'm watching the discussions, and um, I also have the cell phone numbers for a lot of these guys. So um, I will I will send them texts after I see their a, a, a horrible vote, and I will let them know. I will not forget this. There are there are churches out here who will not forget this. So I, I try to keep the pressure on them oh, uh, in this regard. And uh, um, but I, I fully expect it to make it through the Senate. I fully expect it. Uh, it there's no doubt um, when it ends up on Governor Whitmer's desk, it's going to be she's going to uh, uh, put her stamp right on and it's going to go through. So what challenges then will that pose to you, faithful Christians in that state? You get gender expression as a protected class, uh, a group of people that all of a sudden you have to watch your language. Like, how does that affect you? What, how will that affect the church at large? And then we can kind of narrow this down through the filters down to, you know, your people and you, but just the church at large. What do you, what do you see the fallout being like? Well, in a superficial sense, maybe on, on the surface, um, again, just sort of reading through the bill this morning, um, it, essentially what it'll do is it'll make doctrinal confessions uh, felony hate crimes. Um, so if you, if you um, say to someone, and, and it's not necessarily in the fact that you're saying it, it's in the reception of it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's how again, they feel it's, when you speak, right? It's, it's a subjective reception of what it is that you're saying that could be objectively true. It could be subjective or objective what you're saying, but it doesn't matter. It, it's all on the part of the one receiving it. So, so of the words, um, you know, I just jotted them down here. It's, it's at the very end of the bill. Um, you, it can be a felony hate crime for you if you cause someone to, quote, feel terrorized, fret, uh, frightened, or threatened by your words. And, and the way that plays out in the bill, uh, in the sense of you, you've got individual uh, narratives. If you do not show affirmation for that narrative, and by you not showing that, they feel offended or threatened or terrorized. And again, those are those are subjective terms. There's no metrics added in there you can be charged with a felony hate crime. Uh, and so, so confessing the truth of the scriptures, just right at the surface, in any context here in Michigan, you can get into big trouble for that. All right, we'll pause the conversation right there so we can go to our first break. Stay tuned for the rest of what Reverend Christopher Toma has to say and to learn about this year's The Body of Christ in the Public Square and, and how you can get a ticket at a discounted rate. We'll be right back for more of Cross Defense. Many church workers always knew they wanted to serve in Christ's church, but for some, the passion to become a pastor, teacher, deaconess, or other full-time church worker came later in life. Leaving a career to pursue this life of service is not without challenges, yet these are sacred and joyous vocations unlike any other. Set apart to serve, the Church Work Recruitment Initiative of the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate is here to help. Visit kfuo.org SAS to learn how you can put your experience and skills to work through full-time service in Christ's church. That's kfuo.org SAS. My sincerest apologies, friends, for the interruption. Now let's get back to our conversation with Reverend Christopher Toma. Pastors and teachers, people who are actually called to serve in this way and to do it not only within the context of the Lord's house and amongst the people they're called to serve, but out there in the community around them. I mean, we just do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, we, we do these things. So 
we're going to really have to watch our step. I, now I'm, I'm saying we're going to have to watch our step. I don't watch my step. <laughs> <laughs> be I'm aware not, of I'm not, your step. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to be uh, very, very careful of, of tenor and tone and, and body language more so than just the words that we speak, um, which we should be already. But um, it sounds to me like it's a landmine. It's, you know, it's a, it's a field of landmines. You are willing to step on the landmine because you know, as a soldier, before you ventured through that field, there were landmines on the field. So you were prepared for the landmine, but you still don't want to step on one if you don't have to. No, and it's also possible now for the dedicated and directed uh, opponents who want to see the church crushed and want to see the church rid from the earth, which I, I know they exist. I, I talk, have talked with them before. I've been spit on them before or been spit on by them before. Yeah. Um, they, they will set those landmines now and they know exactly how to do that. They, they can... Um, they can make complex questioning uh, a fallacies a reality now that that can come out. They can come right out and make a question of you that you have to answer. And the only way to answer it is to break this law. Um, yes. So so you're you know, you're going to have we're going to have to be very, very careful. Uh, now, we had said before on a surface, you know, what's this going to do for the church? That's going to cause some problems doctrinally uh, with regard to our confession. Um, but in the general for the general public, um, this is a dangerous stepping stone um, because it it really is a, a limitation of free speech. I mean, the First yes. Amendment. I mean, folks are going to be able to call people haters and have the the weight of the government uh, leveled against them just for saying things right. uh, that they find offensive. Um, and now it's now it's cauterized. It's in stone. So, yeah. So then, okay, let's. Joe Public ha is going to now be in danger. Every citizen in Michigan is going to be in that proverbial field of landmines. Yeah, you're a Christian pastor. You know, you have your eyes on. You have you can see that you know the war we're in. Maybe Joe Public doesn't, but you do. Your people do. What do you do? How you mentioned you know the being aware of this for our confession. Certainly, we don't change our confession. So, what what do we do? What are you guys gearing up for? Well, one of the first things we're going to do, um, in fact, um, I have a council meeting tonight, a church council meeting tonight, and uh, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to make a request of them um, that we send all of our governing documents uh, to ADF. Um, I want uh, Alliance Defending Freedom to go through every last one of our governing documents. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, now, we've spent the last five, probably five, six years already working on these things, rewriting certain sections, making sure we have a clear uh, understanding in our, our day school handbook, our parent handbook, um, our, um, our governing documents for the church. Um, I've, I've posted some of these things online for our church website with regard to our definition of marriage, who we will marry and who we won't. Uh, but then I also, in a sense, blended it with uh, the the uh, our theologies of baptism, um, things like that, uh, because a lot of that stuff is turned into sort of a fast food arena. You know, I just yeah. um, I'm stopping by to get married, get a baptism and get a burial. You know, <laughs> well, I prefer the burial before <laughs> uh, any of these other ones. But but, um, you know, you've got sort of that fast food mentality. It's good to have those understandings. Here's what we do and here's why we do it. So uh, defining what it means. Uh, so for a marriage, you know, uh, defining what it means to be a member, to qualify to be married here. Um, you have to have uh, been in attendance so many. I mean, we, you know, we've we've really kind of, I've kind of micromanaged that stuff over the last several years. But now with this uh, with this new law, with the act being rewritten and, of course, with Elliot Larson being rewritten, I want to have all of these documents um, as tight as possible and have, uh, I trust ADF. I know the folks at ADF. Um, I want them to work on these for us. So I'm going to make that recommendation tonight, actually the council meeting that we do that. Um, and we'll likely be sending those off. So that's sort of the first thing churches okay. need to do. They need, I think they need to look at those governing documents and uh, make sure that they are, all the holes are short. I mean, you want them plugged as best as you possibly can. Um, um, so, and, you know, from there, um, I don't know what else we can do except uh, be faithful, yep. uh, confess clearly, uh, and do so in the way 
uh, as best as you can, do so in the way that the Lord Christ himself modeled for us. So, you know, for example, um, I, I go head headlong sometimes into these situations where I know I'm going to be crucified for whatever it is I'm saying. But I'm going to be crucified with a smile on my face, and I'm going to be crucified uh, having been very gentle. You, you know what I mean? I do. Kind of like the guy who comes to the Lord and says, uh, um, you know, spouts off some really horrible theology, and the Lord looks him in the eye and he goes, you know, you're not far from the kingdom. He just told him he's going straight to hell. But, you know, you're not far from the kingdom. You know, having those kinds of conversations, I yeah. think are, people are going to have to be very good at that. And, and that's really hard for a lot of folks because they get, they're getting attacked. They get animated. They want to lash out. They want to, they want to fight back. We have to get rid of that stuff. We cannot respond that way. We have to be, uh, we have to be sneaky as snakes, but we need to go to the slaughter as, as gentle lambs. Yes. Yeah. You know, I've been um, teaching over the last three years or so as we out here in Ferndale have been under the, the same kind of uh, situation. Right. Right. You have spit on and things. Um, and I've been making sure to teach as I hear it come up in the congregation, things that that the old Adam that wants to retaliate or wants to kind of just lash back out. Right. And it's just a yeah. natural knee jerk reaction. In many cases, nobody means anything ill of it, but it is our sinful reaction to threat. Um, and we, we are schooled that way in our culture too. You know I mean? The, right. Our world doesn't really exactly teach us how to be Christians. We're not in that kind of, uh, social Christian culture anymore where we're, we, we right. might actually behave like a Christian when we don't even know we're one. No, it's the opposite. You know, we want, we behave more yeah. like the world, even though we don't want to. And so, well, yeah, those we, landmines, the landmines that you were talking about before, that's where they exist. Yep. And those are land. Those are some of the landmines that they're going to use. They're also going to use um, the, uh, our inability to understand the scriptures, our lack of catechesis, um, yes. a, a lack, a, a fundamental misunderstanding with regard to church and state. You know, uh, two kingdoms theology. Having these things confused and, and misunderstood is going to be a landmine for these folks. Um, they're going to, you know, I, I've already um, just within the last week um, have had to uh, explain over and over again uh, the context of Romans 13. I, I was I was sort of bombarded recently because of a guy that's coming to our our congregation to speak at our conference. Um, Tim Ballard, uh, the you know oh, the inspiration for that new yeah. movie, Sound yeah. of Freedom. He's coming to speak. He's going to be one of the speakers here. Talk about child sex trafficking. Michigan is one of the worst states in the union for child sex trafficking. It's like number two on the list of the worst wow. states. Um, so it's a perfect opportunity for someone who's an expert, is in the field, is uh, got his hands on, and knows all this stuff to come and talk to us. Um, but I but I had to uh, end up at one point along the way, talking privately with someone about Romans 13, you know, um, uh, and it, it drifted off into a conversation about, uh, again, pastor, stay in your lane, let the government do its thing. Uh, Paul says, you know, obey, obey, obey. And um, I, I struggle with that um, argument. I, and I think that the culture loves that argument. They're going to, they're going to throw that on us because Absolute obedience to the government is what they're taking that text to mean. When it's really prescriptive, not descriptive. Of course, Amen. anybody who's an exegete is an exegete of the text. You know, uh, knows that it's prescriptive, uh, but also it, it fails to understand uh, the broader context of what Paul explains there, of what he talks about in other places where he deals with two kingdoms theology, and 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 when you piece these things together, these texts together, you realize that uh, no, a Christian is not supposed to just blindly obey uh, the government. Um, in fact, the see, I, I get off on these uh, rabbit trails. The Magdeburg Confession. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read that. Absolutely, yep. the 15, 1550 document. Wonderful, wonderful document. Very rich. But the the Magdeburg confessors wrote in there. You know, if we just if we just uh, and I forget how it was said. Um, if we just give the government absolute freedom to do whatever it wants, to just abs absolutely blindly obey them and everything, we actually pit God against himself. 
uh, because God is the one who establishes the government and he does it according to the kingdom of the left theology uh, for good for maintaining good, for for guarding natural law, for doing these kinds of things. And if the government comes along and let's say like Michigan just did uh, in November of last year, wrote into its constitution, the murder of the unborn all the way up to and through birth, that are Christians supposed to obey that document? Actually, technically, um, by God's word, that document has now become invalidated. The constitution of Michigan's constitution no longer applies to me. Because it's it's been written in a way that is that is uh, putting all of, of that which is according to God's will into upheaval. Uh, so Christians are not necessarily uh, uh, supposed to obey in that sense. They're supposed to push back. Now, how they push back, that's a different discussion. Right. But just blind obedience to the government, it can do whatever it wants, and you've just got to submit. all the... That, again, is a landmine um, that... Um, that the culture will use. And unfortunately, I would say too, a lot of our pastors use it, yeah. a lot of our past, and, but they don't use it uh, because they don't necessarily, well, I want to be careful not to accuse that, that they don't necessarily understand it, but it's more so if I can keep it in that compartmental is it compartmental uh, way, I'm protected from having to get involved. I don't have yeah. to engage. You know, there's yeah. there's more of a fear that's involved. It might not be something they're willing to say, but it's right. definitely there. I don't have to get involved if I can keep these compartments. Uh, yep. And here the Bible clearly says I'm so. OK, that's that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the two kingdoms theology, and that's running rampant um, in our churches. We need Absolutely. to catechize our people, need to teach them. Yeah, so let's speak about that for a little bit. I mean, you're everyone, well, not everyone, speaking in uh, you know absolutes, but you're known. Heartland is known. Our Saviors is known. You're known for holding com this conference. Is what six years now in a row? Or oh no, ten years. This is ten our twentieth. Our twentieth conference will be this year. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, we've done twenty. Well, no, um, we in the past we we t we typically do one, but we do smaller. Um, Okay. smaller sized conferences throughout the year. So certainly uh, we, you haven't we, had, the, certainly Tim Ballard isn't the first time you've had pushback. Um, no, I get pushback every year uh, since so, it's coming up again in October. <laughs> uh, it, this is usually the time because the promotions start happening more, um, more flyers are getting shared. And then I start getting the private messages from guys, but my own, again, my own guys um, saying, you know, I should, I shouldn't even be a pastor sometimes. That's, that's oh, how wow. ugly it gets. Yeah, I mean, they so come after me pretty the, hard. I mean, the Lutheranism, we have such a good, clear, articulate distinction of the two kingdoms and how to properly Amen. work within them and and how to... these. This is meant to... Um, you would think Lutherans would be the most engaged of Christians in both kingdoms because we have such clear... Uh, marching order, so to speak, but it seems yeah. like we're almost the least involved <laughs> because we we misread them. What's what's going on there from your take? Just kind of well, yeah. Again, I when I was at the seminary, um, and I, I don't mean again, I don't mean to sound uh, accusatory in any sure, way. No, but no, when no, I was at the, when I was at the cemetery, when I was at the seminary, the cemetery, the <laughs> seminary, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Some we people look back at it like that, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I loved being there. I loved, love uh, and I miss being there. I love being a student, and that was a place to be one in some wonderful ways. But anyway, when I was there, I don't ever remember hearing even that term, uh, the two kingdoms. Okay. Um, that didn't become, I think, uh, more popularized or refreshed, I say, which should say in a popular way, until a few years after I was out of there. And, and that's because, again, um, we, you know, we're in this great decline right now. Again, some folks would argue that we're not, but I would say that we are uh, looking at the data. We're in this great decline. And as that has sort of picked up steam even more so to where it's pretty much a, an absolute downward vertical trajectory, um, that term has become more popular. People have uh, been looking into it. And interestingly, okay. in my studies, I, I'm, I'm working for my uh, doctorate right now. And in a lot of my studies that I've checked so far, it is mostly the evangelicals who are stumbling upon it. They're the ones who are finding the two kingdoms doctrine. They're digging through the, uh, the founding fathers writings and they're, and they're seeing 
uh, recommendations or nudge, you know, little elbow nudges to Luther saying Luther had it right. Um, so, so you said before, you know, we have this clear sidedness. Um, we have this wonderfully rich heritage that our nation, um, f- the founding fathers, 99% of them looked toward that when they understood the separation of church and state. Uh, and from that, they've, they've managed to um, lay out this wonderful uh, philosophy, I would call it. Now, there's really two. Um, you have absolute separationism, um, which is absolutely separate. You know, the church cannot do anything with the state. The state cannot do anything with the church. And there's that. But then what you really find is more of an accommodationist uh, philosophy, okay. which means that the church understand, and it's it's because of, of the church's understanding of things, the scriptural teaching on this, the church understands the benefit of cooperating with the government, assisting in its maintenance of its ordination, and the state understands the benefit of religion in a society for the sake of moral law, for the sake of upholding natural law, for the sake of these kinds of things. So the state gives leniency and actually leans toward the church on occasion, and the church looks to the state and and does what it can to help serve and support it in its role. Um, when you look at the the array uh, of a, the founding fathers and original documentation, biographies, things like that, that's the way they're talking. They're they're always talking that way. They have this accommodationist understanding. The Lutheran Church, um, for the most part, over the years, has lost that. They've fallen into what became popularized in the early part of the 20th century um, of absolute separation. There, you know, you can, the church cannot influence and the state cannot. It, Unfortunately, when that happens, um, who's driving that narrative typically? It's the state. (laughs) It's absolutely the state. The state's coming in and putting its thumb on the church and trying to crush the church. And we're seeing that expand and and exponentially uh, do the, the things that they're doing. Please excuse the interruption, my friends. We're up against our last break. We'll be right back after this break to continue our conversation, to conclude our conversation with Pastor Toma, and to find out about this year's The Body of Christ in the Public Square and how you can get discounted tickets to that event. Be right back. Military veteran, engineer, entrepreneur. These are just some of the former careers held by current LCMS pastors. Careers that they left behind to serve congregations in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. No matter the background, our Lord calls men who have a passion for the word and a love for serving Christ to be pastors. A sacred, joyful, and essential vocation. If you or a friend have been praying and thinking about becoming a pastor, visit weareyourseminaries.org and put your experience and skills to new use in pastoral ministry. Visit weareyourseminaries.org seminaries.org. Welcome back to Cross Defense. Let's get right back into our conversation with the Reverend Christopher Toma so that you can learn how you can get your discounted tickets to this year's The Body of Christ in the Public Square Conference held in Heartland, Michigan. If we shifted from the accommodation model to the absolute model, and then we go back to your um, articulation of Romans 13 and how a lot of guys take that, then the absolute separation just gives way to absolute submission because the state's exactly. the one in the driver's seat. Exactly. And and yeah. so you find now now what happens there? You find an interpretation of doctrine at that point based on the church or on the state's perspective. Yeah. So the state comes in and says you have to obey, we're doing this for your good. So now here we are in 2023 and I know of churches that are still closed. I know of churches that are still putting mask mandates. I know of churches that are really you, that, that there is a is that is that something that we're really going to see happening? Absolutely, but but you've got this momentum, you've got this motion coming at us in this way, uh, and and you have uh, this fear, I think, on the part of of a lot of guys, uh, who and, and you probably understand what I'm talking about. You know this as well as anyone else. But what is going to keep a pastor um, from from speaking the way that we're speaking right now, from from engaging in this way? Well, there, there are those typical fear of, you know, t- being despised by the ones they're preaching to, you know, offending the people in the pews. What happens with that? 
Um, well, when the people go, so goes the money. And so goes the, you, you know what I mean? You, yeah. you know, we, we've got this sort of this, this success driven model of we got to have all these. Now, hold on a second. I mean, even the Lord said, when the son of man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Right. I mean, the church is not necessarily going to grow. Um, the Lord is calling for us to be faithful. So, so don't be afraid of preaching and teaching faithfully of doing that. But then second of all, I think, um, having a, a misunderstanding of the two kingdoms means you're going to, by default, have a misunderstanding of the left-handed kingdoms, um, laws. So, so take, for example, uh, the Johnson amendment, yeah. uh, the Johnson amendment is the one that everybody's afraid of. And, and realistically speaking, I think since it was, since it was created, maybe three cases have made it into courts across the United States and, and maybe, and all, all three of them lost. I mean, having a having a fear that if you get up in the pulpit and you preach about abortion uh, you preach pro-life things or you preach about or you preach against lgbtq incorporated um, type things or you preach against critical race theory things that are completely counterintuitive to the gospel itself if you preach about these things in a way that you're preaching from the text what's already there preaching to god's people so that they can not only know the forgiveness of sins, but now take that forgiveness into the world and navigate in a world that's trying to crush that within them. If you preach those things, you're in jeopardy of the government coming down on you. No, you're not. <laughs> that's not true. Um, that's right. You're not. Um, there, there are literally like two or three things that you can't do according to the Johnson Amendment, and they have nothing to do with... Uh, in necessarily endorsing candidates, endorsing platforms, speaking to current topics, cultural topics, things like that. And besides, you know, all of these things that uh, we're afraid of, that the culture has imposed on us to say, you can't talk about these things. They're all Christological things. The church already <laughs> owns them. Yes. There are things. The, the church owns them. So, so no, the state has no right to come in and tell the pastors, you can't preach on this. We own the topic of life. I mean, that's ours. <laughs> that's right. We I love own the topic. That. That's right. That's we right. own the topic of marriage. Uh, that, that is, that is God's thing, you know? Yes. So, so, you know, this, you know, last but I again, this, to, when I talked to oh, ADF last, um, I was talking to one of their lawyers maybe a year ago now. Um, and okay. he told me that, they're actually excited for another case to come up that they could take the Johnson yeah. Amendment back to the to the courts because it's so flimsy. It won't hold up. Yeah. And ADF knows that. And so they're just kind of they're <laughs> the way he portrayed it, they're almost sitting around waiting for the opportunity yeah. to throw this thing off, you know? Yeah. Um well the and, Johnson and, Amendment too, it, it already gets in the way of church doctrine in a I think a pretty significant way. Um, which I've I've talked about in public a couple of times in some speeches, and I know it's dangerous ground. And people who are probably going to listen to this and watch this are going to send me messages, I'm sure. Um, but the the Johnson Amendment um, forbids punishment of anyone in the congregation that goes uh, against uh, the effort, let's say, of the clergy. Um, so. So if a, if a pastor, well, you, you could probably know what that means right away. Um, they're looking at excommunication as punishment. We don't see excommunication as punishment. Uh, but I have talked before about the church needing to reconsider its position on excommunication relative to political things. If you've got people sitting in your pews who willfully support the murder of the unborn, let's just take that topic. Sure. If you've got someone sitting in your pews who believes that it's a fundamental human right, and they've done it 25 times to, to murder a child in their womb, there's something you've got to talk with them about. And, and at, that could lead to excommunication. Right, naturally. Now, excommunication, again, of course, is not a punishment. It's something that is given by God's grace to us as a tool to stir repentance. We want repentance. We want uh, to exercise the wonderful keys that open the kingdom. Yep. The Johnson Amendment won't let you do that. And if you do do that, and, and this person that you excommunicate files a complaint, you'll end up in court over that. Um, and I, I think we need to reconsider that. And I would love for ADF to... Uh, take that on. We need we need to get rid of that. Um, yeah. Churches should be free, if even if they want to spend money 
I mean, that's not something we would do. Um, we wouldn't spend money on someone's campaign. Um, but um, I have gotten in the pulpit and supported candidates. I have gotten up and said, you know, by the way, this topic's coming up and I'm preaching on the text, but I say, oh, by the way, <laughs> here's something you need to pay attention to. Prop three, proposal three is coming through. We're going to change the constitution. You need to know this person and this person and this person in the legislature. Call them, tell them, fight against this. And this it's is your Christian duty. What you're, what you're doing is what's missing, which is exactly, I mean, I would say the biggest part of this, the battle that we're in we hear Christians lament all the time about the changing of the culture. How did we get to this place? All this right. kind of stuff. Well, the big part is pastors stop doing what you just said you do in the pulpit. They we stopped exercising our our vocation of instructing people from a biblical right. perspective on the issues that they're engaged with in their daily life, which is what we're supposed right. to be doing. And it, a lot of it now it's been going on for so long that we have generations of pastors who are so comfortable, like you said that they don't want to step outside of that compartment because what will that do, not necessarily for um, their hearers, but for them. And, and I don't mean right. that in an accusatory way either, but there is a reality that, and, and you and I both know this as pastors and, and being humans who don't like tension or conflict is in, just the same as anybody else, yeah, that yeah. there's a tension in our hearts to want to avoid that confrontation and any hostility that's going to come from that. And, and I really think this is where pastors need to pardon the colloquialism, but man up and, and do your job, right? Take the yeah. blows when they come. So that, as you said, Pastor Toma, so that the, the Lord finds faithfulness on the earth. You know, this is, I, I struggle here in California with this idea that you know, we have a, a, a long, we're asleep, you know, we're supposed to be awake. And when the manager, the, the owner of the house comes back and he finds his, his people asleep, this is a problem. We, we operate here so much in California that, oh, the Lord's going to come. We talk like that. He'll, yeah, he's coming back. But we don't operate with a sense of urgency like it's tomorrow or today. Yeah, we don't expect he'll be back before we uh, end the unionism problem happening in the church next door. Like, oh, yeah, we, we'll be, right, just right. slow the row and just love. And, and it's, it's a problem. Sorry, I don't mean to take over the mic, but uh, no, no, yeah. no. That's uh, you're right, and um, um, we we are not um, working with the fervor and the vigilance. I think that uh, the scriptures require of us that yeah. they they demand of us that we pay attention, that we be ready, um, and we you know that fervor leads to people saying things like it will. It leads to that slothfulness we described at the very beginning of this. Um, yeah. It'll never happen. You know, that'll never happen. You know, yeah, it will. <laughs> the well of sin's creativity is awfully deep. I mean, look <laughs> at it. It's, it's, it's amazing what they, what sin comes up with, what the devil can, can inspire in folks. It, it will reminds happen. me of Rod Dreher's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, well, no, I, I'm just saying it's an, it's uh, the devil is no slouch uh, and yeah. he takes advantage of the opportunity to cut these tr uh, transmission lines from pastors to their Christians, you know, don't don't do this and don't do that, and and weighing upon us these fears and and all these uh, imposed regulations that may not even exist, right? Uh, that we that we uh, that prevents us from being faithful. And that gets me to where I was, yeah, I was just going to say it reminds me of Rod Dreher's book, Live Not by Lies. And I don't know yeah. if you've read that book. I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. This idea that we actually enslave ourselves long before the authoritarianism takes right. over. You know, we we right. willingly comply to things that we need not comply to and that just paves the way for these things to happen we don't understand how we open the gate many right. many times for this um, well we'll sometimes fact. impose upon ourselves like we said before uh false narratives you know yeah. we, we we how does the church proven that over the years i mean we've imposed upon children things that are completely foreign to them the church is very capable of that you know saying that a think in the deepest sense a child shouldn't be baptized it can't have faith oh that's just ridiculous okay that's and we impose these restrictions you know blah 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 um pastors do the same thing and they have to, i think they have to be very careful um david scare i think is the one who said it the best uh years ago he said uh you know when you get up and preach preach the text he says too many of you guys are you're worried about telling everybody off for five minutes and telling them how it's going to be okay for another five, you know, as a, and that means you <laughs> preach law and gospel, you know, preach the text guys. If you preach the text while at the same time aware 
of the text's verity in the lives of the people around you, what you're going to end up finding is that you stumbled into saying things, oh my goodness, that the culture might not want you to say. Uh, you might find yourself saying things like, you know, it's a bad idea that we let the Michigan legislature write into our constitution murder. <laughs> uh, we probably should, and now, and now, because we know that the gospel changes us, it recalibrates us, it sends us out into the world to be faithful, Matthew 5, to be the, the salt and the light. That means we might have to actually do something. We can't be as those pastors uh, in Luke chapter 10, priest walking by and seeing the guy on the other, de dying there. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I got priestly stuff to do. I got to write sermons. I got to make visits. I got to help the guy. Yeah. You might actually have to help the guy. Yeah. And even even Jesus kind of says that, you know, help the guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. So I, I've kept you a long time here, Pastor Toma. Uh, let me ask you a couple more questions before I let you go. Sure, sure. You're on the radar. You, I mean, you got the cell numbers of a lot of these guys, the legislature, you know, the people, movers and shakers. Um, obviously, you, you bring in a lot of big names who talk um, across the country, A-list speakers, commentators, cultural um you know people who are engaged in the cultural fight you're you're on the radar certainly the state knows about you am i right yeah. in assuming that yeah is yeah, there I've had... any is there any extra danger for your congregation giving these you know this bill 4474 things like this are they gunning for you I don't know if they're gunning for me. I would say um, they are, but they are watching. I mean, there was a time there a couple of years ago where um, the attorney general's office was sending people into my pews um, on, regularly on a Sunday to listen to the preaching. So, wow. so I mean, that, that stuff does happen. Um, and, but again, you know, if you're going to do this, if you're going to be out in the, out on the playground, you got to deal with the bullies too. So yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything as of late, um, where uh, our congregation has been targeted. Oh, well, although that's during the time of COVID because we just, you know, we're like, whatever, um, they did, they shut everybody down and they didn't want us here on Sundays, but I kept, um, instead of worshiping on Sundays, I opened it up in the middle of the week, like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and did like 20 divine services face to face without mass, serve the Lord's supper, you know all this stuff for three straight days, but the state in its brilliance and its efficiency showed up on Sundays to check the lot and make sure it was empty. And then, and then left, they didn't come back Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So oh, <laughs> like, one of the, one uh, of the blessings of the insufficiencies of the state. I love it. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, well, so, so do they watch us? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do they, do they reach to us personally? Yeah. Am I okay. worried about it? No, not really. I Good mean, man. we got to do what man. we got to do. We'll be praying for you on that on that front. Now, last question: uh, Tell us is what you got coming up for this year's conference, if you can, whatever you want to talk about with that, and then we'll kind of wrap up with that. You said already, yeah. Tim Ballard coming. Yeah, Tim Ballard. Tim Ballard was a last um, sort of a last minute addition. Um, I was working with the Michigan um, Michigan party to get some speakers to their uh, Mackinac conference. They, they have a Mackinac conference every other year. It's a big policy conference. And so I was working with Jim Caviezel's folks, uh, and got him lined up there. But as I was working with Jim Caviezel and his guys, um, I happened to uh, be introduced to Tim Ballard's folks. And, you know, Jim Caviezel plays, uh, Tim Ballard in the movie. So, uh, and I, while I'd love to have Jim come and maybe that'll happen in the near future. Um, I, I wanted Tim, uh, to come. A and after talking with them and getting, getting some information, I thought it'd be a good to add him, um, have him come. Cause again, this is a real important inf uh, point in our state. I mean, it's an issue. So Tim is coming that, and that's been secured within the last month and a half, although that almost blew up because of my own guys, but, uh, it, it's all been sorted out. Everything is good. Um, so Tim is coming, uh, Molly Ziegler Hemingway is coming. Um, she's a, a dear Lutheran woman, a very faithful coming, and we all know her from Fox News and all that, Federalist. Um, let's see. Um, so Tim, Molly, of uh, Seth Dillon, the CEO of the Babylon Bee, he'll be with us. Um, Dr. James Lindsay, um, he's uh, coming as well. Um, and uh, let's see, Riley Gaines. Riley Gaines actually just wrote a really nice endorsement for uh, my, one, of my, uh, one of my books recently. So oh, wow. uh, she's coming. 
and then I'll be speaking too. So, you, so it's a really good one. Lineup. Those, right? I do. Yeah. I open yeah. up the conference typically and I, and I spend my, I have about 45 minutes to an hour where I give a paper on something and, but that paper typically has an aspect of f teaching people what the two kingdoms theology is. Here's what it's all about. Here's why we're doing what we're doing. Here's why we can have people who we may not be in alignment with on sharing the same stage and telling you these, these things. Uh, we're not worshiping together. We're not, uh, we're not uh, preaching and teaching uh, uh, scripture in a syncretistic way. We are expert witnesses coming to talk about issues so that you understand it as a Christian church and can go out into the world and navigate accordingly. Praise God. Um, so, yeah. Well yeah. So, and it's, and we've been doing it for 10 years. Again, we've had 20 conferences so far and, and, uh, and all has been, all has been good. So it's October 7th. Is that right? October 7th. Could I give the link for yeah, it? Do whatever you, yeah, of course. Uh, I have to I'll, remember. I'll include it, it in the show see. notes. If you can send me the link, I can, I can put it in the show notes below. I can do that. I'll say it on the air here real sure. quick. It's body body of Christ 2023, all one word, dot eventbrite.com. And eventbrite is B-R-I-T-E. So body of Christ 2023 dot eventbrite.com. Um, and folks can register. Um, there are discounts. If you put in a, a promo code of we win, all one word in, in caps, I think there's a 20% discount or something like that on any of the tickets in any of the categories. So perfect. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be great to have folks come. Great. Well, I know at least one listener of cross defense is already planning on being out there to meet Dr. Lindsay. Uh, talked to, he, I read his email last month or last week about this and, uh, he's excited. So, uh, yeah, I know people are listening uh, and I'll oh, tell them in the, I'll tell them in the, uh, the outro here, I'll, I'll reiterate your, your, um, your link and tell them point them your way and brother thank you for carving out some time i know i mean this far away from the conference it's only a couple months you got to be really busy plus you got a lot of things going on always um i'm looking forward to your well, new school book. just that's great. school just started actually oh. too so we're, we're yeah. running full blast here <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah well yeah. good good well brother thank you so much for coming on and talking about this bill 4474 and um thank you for all you're doing out there in michigan for the people, your own people, but also just for the witness of Christ to the world and keep leading the way. I appreciate that. Amen. And thank you for all you're doing. Uh, stay Absolutely. the course. Stay strong. Amen. Thank you. Blessings. The Body of Christ in the Public Square Conference is sure to be an educational experience, my friends, that will equip your mind, excite your imagination, and no doubt with Reverend Christopher Toma bringing you God's word will no doubt comfort your souls with Christ crucified for the forgiveness of your sins. This is exactly what we do here on the show. And so it's a good, good way to kick off having guests back on Cross Defense. The link to that conference to where you can get your tickets are in the show notes below. Make sure you check that out. It was a pleasure to have Pastor Toma on the show today to usher in this new return phase of the show. And as we learn about the many and various cultural topics that we encounter in our daily lives. We want to make sure we're fully equipped, that we do have the ability to think and imagine what's going on around us from a biblical worldview and bring it all back to the cross. So thank you for tuning in to the show today and for all of your comments, questions, and support of the program. If there's a particular person, my friend, that you'd like to hear from as a guest on this show, Please let me know by using the contact form at stmarksferndale.com slash contact, S-T-M-A-R-K-S, ferndale.com slash contact. Let us know, and we'll do our best to get them on the show. In the meantime, pray for the people of Michigan, and especially for our brothers of our Savior Lutheran Church in Heartland, Michigan. They're faithfully serving their neighbors in both the left-hand and the right-hand kingdoms of God. To paraphrase St. Paul's words in Acts 26, 29. Would that not only you, but also all who hear Pastor Toma this day might become such as he is. Thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense. I'll talk to you next week. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.